Well, if you have your Bibles, open them to the book of Judges. That is where we're going to be this morning. And we are going to be in Judges chapter 6 and chapter 7. We're really going to focus a lot of our time on Judges chapter 7 today, but we are going to briefly hit chapter 6 first to kind of give you an idea on what's going on. But to give you an idea of the book of Judges and where we're at in our story. So the book of Judges is basically just a continuation of the book of Joshua. If you guys don't know what the book of Joshua is all about, it's basically a continuation from the book of Exodus. And so we see we see this book of Exodus and that Moses, he takes the children of Israel out of Egypt in slavery and he brings them into the wilderness for 40 years. And after the 40 years of the Israelites traveling around the wilderness, we see that Moses passes away. He was leading the Israelites and the new leader, Joshua, then takes them into the promised land. And from that, in the whole book of Joshua, we see that, that they go into the promised land and they begin to defeat their enemies and they defeat the Amalekites and they begin to become this nation, Israel. But at the end of Joshua, we see Joshua is now passing away. And Joshua is trying to encourage the Israelites that now that they're in the promised land and now that they're becoming this nation of Israel, not to stop, right? That there were still enemies around them to continue to go and conquer over them and to let everyone around them know who their God is and who they serve. And so that is where we get into the book of Judges is when Joshua passes away, God then brings up judges to, in a sense, rule over uh, Israel. Now understand when we say judges, um, in your minds you're probably thinking of a judge like we would know one, someone inside of a courtroom, right, in this big black gown and would be judging cases all day, but that's not what a judge is. Really what a judge was, was someone who was kind of in a leadership role, right? He might have been the leader of an army and he, he brought justice for Israel. And so with these judges, we see through the entire book of Judges, there's a cycle that begins to happen. And as the cycle continues to go on and on, the, thing, the more things get worse and worse and worse, and there's less godliness in Israel. And so what that cycle looks like is, like I said, Joshua, there's great victory. They are now this, this nation of Israel. And this victory then brings them into a time of peace. And so it's a time of peace. Everything's great. People are falling after the Lord. But eventually, because of this time of peace, it brings a time of sin. And then this time of sin then brings a time of oppression because the repercussions of their sins now allowed the enemies to come and take over them. And so there was a time of oppression of their enemies. And eventually, this time of oppression would lead them to a time of repentance to the Lord. They would realize their sins, and they would repent to the Lord. And that time of repentance would then, again, bring a time of victory. And after a time of victory, guess what? Peace and peace, sin, and so on and so forth. And we see this cycle throughout the entire book of Judges. However, as the cycle continues to go on, there's more wickedness in Israel, and the judges only get worse and worse until the end of the book. And it's interesting, at the, the very last verse of Judges, it's in chapter 1, verse 25. It says, in, there, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so that was the state that Israel had gotten by the end of Judges, that everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. There was no righteousness. It was all wickedness. They were living completely in sin. But before we get there, that's not where we're at in our story. Our story begins in chapter 6 with one of the judges of Israel, and his name is Gideon. So if you're f familiar with Gideon, um, he was kind of an interesting character that we see. He started off really well inside of his life. And actually... I would say he didn't start off really well because he was kind of a cowardly type of person. He was afraid of the Midianites in this time, and we'll, we'll explain that as we go through these chapters. But he was a coward of a person, but we're going to see that even though Gideon, this coward of his person, this person that was a nobody, God is still going to use him to deliver Israel from the Midianites. And so with that, if you guys would look with me in chapter 6, we'll begin in verse number 1. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds in which are in the mountains. So it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. 
Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter into the land and destroy it. And so here in our story, we're seeing that this was a time of rebellion for the Israelites. They were living inside of sin. They did evil on the side of the Lord. And so because of that, now we see that the Lord is going to bring oppression over them, right? The Midianites for seven years, it said, would have an oppression over them. And God is going to use this oppression of the Midianites in a sense to chastise his children. Oftentimes what God kind of does to us, right? We'll explain that a little bit more as we go on. But we see this time where the Israelites, they're taken over by the Midianites. Anytime they had any type of sustenance, the Midianites would come in and just wipe it away. They're hiding in caves and dens. And then it finally says in verse 6, So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all of those who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. And so we see here that finally it says after seven years, the children of Israel begin to cry out to the Lord. It's kind of interesting that it took them seven years to finally cry out to the Lord and for them to hear, right? You would think that right away, once the Midianites had taken over and taken them in captivity, that they would instantly realize their sins and that they would come to repentance. But it took them seven years of being under oppression by the Midianites until they finally began to cry out with the Lord. And I can't help but think, I wonder if they, they felt like they could do it in their own strength. Because they were a mighty army, right? They were this mighty nation who went into the promised land and they conquered over all of their enemies at that time. And so they were definitely a strong, powerful army. And so I'm sure they thought to themselves, well, we can eventually take over the Midianites. And they began to do things in their own strength until seven years passed. And they finally got to that breaking point and said, Lord, we repent. And they cried out to the Lord. That's oftentimes what we do, doesn't it? We oftentimes think that we can do things in our own power when times of tr struggle, when times of, of difficulty come in our lives, we like to try to deal with it ourselves. We say, don't worry, I can do it. And so we begin to try and try and try, but as we begin to try, things only get worse and worse and worse and worse until we finally reach the point of our breaking point, and then we resort to God. God becomes our last resort inside of our lives. But church, I would say, why would God be our last resort in our lives? Why do we have to go through seven years of oppression before we finally get the message of our sins and we come before the Lord and ask him to deliver us? Why not God be our first resort and to say, Lord, please help us in this time. I cannot do this on my own strength. I'm going to rely on you straight from the get-go. I don't want to go through this time of oppression. I don't want to go through these times of difficulties. I want to give it over to you because in your strength, I can conquer this difficulty. But the children of Israel had to take seven years in order to finally come to this place of repentance. Now an angel of the Lord, in verse 11, came and sat under the terebith tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all of this happened to us? And where of all of his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. It's funny how quick we are to blame God for all of our problems. As soon as things start getting bad inside of our lives, as soon as we face difficulties, the first thing we go to is that God has failed us and his faithfulness has failed us. But understand something, that for everyone in this room, whether you're a believer or not, everyone who's ever lived, we are going to face trials. We are going to face difficulties. That's not God putting that on you. That's simply because we live in a fallen, sinful world. And living in this fallen and sinful world, we are going to deal with the difficulties in our life. 
Now, the Lord will use those difficulties in our life to chastise us, right? If you guys were here last week, Pastor Chris kind of talked about this with his children, that if his children are, are running around in the street, he's not going to just say, well, I love them so much, I'm going to let them continue running in the street, right? He's going to say, get back here, otherwise I'm going to kick your butt, right? And he's going to scream at his children because they shouldn't be playing inside of the street. Does that mean he doesn't love them because he's screaming at his children? No, absolutely not. He's, he's screaming at them. He might be even upset or angry, but that's because he loves his children. He loves them so much that he doesn't want them to get run over by a car. He doesn't want them to, to get injured. And he sees the danger ahead that they don't see. And it's the same thing with God. He sees the danger of our sins. He sees the path that we're going down. And because he loves us so much, he's going to allow the difficulties in our, our life to continue to, to be inside of our lives and oppress us for a season in order for us to get the message of our sins. It also, not only that, but difficulty will allow us to grow inside of our faith. Difficulties, I will tell you this, is that difficulties don't mean the faithfulness of God has failed us. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And so you might, if you ever find yourself in a position saying that the faithfulness of God has failed you, let me tell you, you are wrong because the Bible says, Paul would say in Romans, let God be true and every man be a liar. We can say that with full on confidence, if the word of God says it, it is true. And there's no arguing it. If the word of God says the faithfulness of God will not fail you, I can promise you the faithfulness of God will not fail you. And you might say, well, Josh, you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand the season that I'm in, the difficulties that I'm going through. If you, if you had any idea what I was going through, then you would understand the faithfulness of God has filled me. And you're right, I don't know what everyone's going through in this room. I don't know the difficulties and the pains you guys might have, but though I don't understand that, we can know that the faithfulness of God, we can rely on it and trust in it, and that, as Romans 8.28 says, all things work together for good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so though we don't see the future, we don't see what God is doing in our lives with these difficulties, we can know for certain because what the word says, that God knows the future and we don't, right? Because we're so focused on, on our surroundings, we're so focused on the situation that is before us, but God, he sees the things of the future. He sees the things that are going to play out and what needs to be played out inside of your life. And if you can rely on that and trust in that, man, you're going to be grown in your faith, man you are going to be that much closer to the Lord and he is able to do that work inside of your life. But I love too that when Gideon says this and he's questioning the Lord and, and he's kind of throwing this pity party, Lord, if, if you were so good and you're going to deliver us from the Midianites, then, then where is the goodness of God, right? But God doesn't even answer him at this point. He just completely ignores what, what Gideon is questioning at this point and just continues because he knows that Gideon's out of line and, and he's God, so he doesn't need to, he doesn't need to answer the silly question, but he says in verse 14, then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this side of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest of Manasseh and I am the least of my father's house. And so here comes the excuses of Gideon. We see that, that Gideon is, is called by God to go out and deliver Israel from the Midianites, and yet he claims that he is not capable. And we see this time and time again. This is a very common theme throughout the Bible, that when God calls somebody, they like to complain, and they like to say that they're not capable, right? We see this with Moses in Exodus chapter 3, when God calls Moses to take the children of Israel out of bondage in, in Egypt, and he's calling him to, to go before Pharaoh that Moses keeps saying, well, well, Lord, I'm not eloquent, and I'm not this, and, and I'm not capable, and this and this and that, and, and he continues to complain and argue with God, saying that he's not able to do this. We even see this with Jeremiah the prophet. In Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah is complaining to God when God calls him to be a prophet because he was just this young teenage kid that didn't know anything, and so he's saying, Lord, how can I be a prophet? I don't know anything. I'm young. They're going to look at me, and they're going to laugh. And yet God was calling them anyways, and everywhere you look, not just those two, but everywhere you look, we see people inside of the Bible who are complaining that they are not capable. Capable, And let me tell you, the reality is they are not capable. God purposely searches out those who are the smallest, least known people 
to fulfill his will, just like here with Gideon. And we see the same with King David being the youngest of all of his brothers. He was a runt of the litter. We see this with Joseph, same thing, being the second youngest of all of his brothers, and all of his brothers beating him up and throwing him into slavery. And we see this even with the disciples who were, had, no, had no reputation. They were just a bunch of fishermen that no one knew, no one cared about, and yet Jesus called them to be their disciples. And so time and time again, we also see here, it's a reality with Gideon, that God chooses those who are not capable. And why is that? Because God's capable and he wants to show his glory through the uncapable. Listen, if God is able to use failures like me and you in this room, man, that shows that, that if God is not in it, if God is not in our lives, it could not happen. It brings the glory of God out. And God calls Gideon a mighty man of valor, which is interesting, right? Because we know that, that Gideon was not a mighty man of valor. Gideon was this, this scaredy cat who was running away from the Midianites and, and he didn't want to do what God was calling him to do and he was making up all these excuses except God still calls him a mighty man of valor. Does that mean God was wrong for calling him a mighty man of valor? No, absolutely not. He's calling him a mighty man of valor because as we are going to see in chapter 7, this mighty man of valor is simply putting his trust in God. That finally Gideon will get to this point where he puts his full faith in the Lord and he trusts God to go out and fight his battles. And at that point, that is where his mighty man of valor comes from. Not by his own might, but by him relying on the might of the Lord. And I can say this is true with me too as a pastor, that for me, I would have never imagined being here, right, right here today, standing before all of you guys and teaching the word. There was a time in my life where public speaking was my worst fear, that there was absolutely no chance that I would ever get up before someone and teach. I was like that kid in high school that if there was like a, a presentation that I, we had to do in front of the class that I would just call in sick that day, you know, and I would find any way to get out of it because I didn't want to be up in front of people. And yet God has called me here to, to be a pastor and to go before you guys and preach the word. And I'm grateful for that. I'm so grateful that God gave me that fear of, of public speaking. And he's also didn't make me naturally good at it either, right? I'm not this like super fluent. I'm not this like crazy funny guy who's up here and just being able to naturally speak and, and just so fluent and natural like a lot of good speakers are. And I'm grateful for that because any time that if anybody is ever impacted by what I'm saying by teaching the word of God, I'm instantly humbled because I know it had nothing to do with me, right? Because I'm not this, this natural speaker. I'm not able to speak in front of people eloquently and, and be able to, to tug on people's emotions. If anyone's emotions are tugged, it's because of what the Lord is saying through me. And that keeps me humble, right? That keeps me humble to know that, that it's only God that can impact people and not through my power. Listen, God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. The story continues in verse 16. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who, uh, who talk with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come with you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And so right here is where we're going to kind of stop, and we're going to skim through. We're going to go through to chapter 7. But if you guys want to read the rest of chapter 6, um, I would encourage you guys to do that. Uh, later on today, but to give you an idea of what's going on here, so now Gideon is asking God to give him a sign to show that this is truly from the Lord, and so the Lord meets him there and gives him this sign, and so now Gideon is in this place saying, okay, I know this is the Lord, and the Lord is now calling me. And the first thing that we see in verse 25 of chapter 6 is that God calls him to tear down the altars of Baal, and so that is from chap or, excuse me, verses 25 through 35, where Gideon is destroying the altar of Baal. And then the very last part of chapter 6, we see for whatever reason Gideon wants a whole other sign from God to make sure, you know, he was just questioning, just making sure, okay, I had this great victory with, with Baal and, and tearing down the altars, but I don't know, God, can you just give me one more sign before I defeat the Midianites, right? And so we see a little bit of a lack of faith, but it is an awesome story. Um, it's a whole different sermon in itself, and so for the sake of time, we won't go over that. But that is in chapter 6, verse 36 to the end of the chapter. But now getting into chapter 7, we are going to see this battle that is going to take place between the Israelites and the Midianites. And I want to look with you 
with three different keys for us in our lives today and our service to the Lord. We're going to look at, in this story, there's three different keys on what it's like to serve the Lord and to have an open heart to allow the Lord to work inside of your life. And so if you look with me in verse number one, then Jerobael, that is Gideon, and so that's the name that, that he was given after he defeated or he tore down the altars of Baal was Jerobael, which just means destroyer of Baal. Uh, but that's the only time that he's ever mentioned as Jerobael. But Gideon and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them from the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. And so we're getting ready for battle in chapter 7, and we see here that God is saying that he needs to cut down this Israelite army. Now keep in mind that it doesn't say it yet, but it will say that the Israelite army at one point was 32,000 men. So that was a pretty big army, 32,000. However, the Midianites were much, much bigger with 120,000 men. And so that was already a big difference. The odds of that is four Midianites to every one Israelite. And so the odds are already in the Midianites' favor greatly going into this battle. And yet God is saying that we need to cut down this army because these people, man, with, with their sin, they're going to take credit for what I want to do through them. They're going to take credit for having the victory because they're such a big army, right? And so God is saying um, that we need to cut it down. And so this is kind of the same concept of what we saw in chapter 6 with Gideon being this, this little man that no one knew anything about, this guy who's not capable. We're going to see the same thing, this miracle that God wants to do to show if God was not in it, it wouldn't have been able to be done. And so in verse 3 it says, Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. And so at this point, the army is now cut from 32,000 to only 10,000. Um, and the reason for God doing this is it says that God didn't want anyone in the battle to be afraid, right? If anyone was ever afraid to go into battle, he's saying, send them home. And this is actually a really practical reason. This is even practical for war today, is that if you have a bunch of soldiers who are afraid to go in war, they'll have the tendency to retreat. And as others are, other, as soldiers watch their comrades retreat, though they might not have been afraid to go into battle at first, as they watch people retreat, it kind of changes the psychology of the war because then you begin to become afraid and also want to retreat as well. And so it's really important in a, in a battle that your soldiers are not afraid to go into this war. And so we see this um, with God, is that God doesn't want anyone there who doesn't want to be there. And this is key number one in our service to the Lord. That is availability. My question to you guys is this. Are you available? When God tries to show you his will in your life and which way to go, do you have the tendency to keep moving forward and to continue to search after his will? Or do you have the tendency to retreat? Because listen, God wants to use us. I believe that every single one of us in this room, God has a plan for you and God wants to use you in your life, but he will only take you as far as you are willing to go. Jesus says in Matthew twenty-two fourteen. For many are called, but few are chosen. So you might be asking yourself, well, what does that mean? Many are called, but few are chosen. It kind of sounds like those are the same exact things. How do I know if I'm called versus being chosen? Listen, I believe personally that all believers are called by God. But you must first choose to be chosen by God. Again, he will only take you as far as you're willing to go. He is calling each and every one of us, but you must make that decision to be chosen by God. And so it is us to, it's up to us. Do we want all that God has for us, church? Are we willing to make sacrifices and take steps of faith, or are we being governed by the circumstances around us? Are we being governed by fear of not knowing what the Lord has for us next? Verse number four says this, But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same will not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. 
Likewise, everyone who gets down on their hands and knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped putting their hand to their mouth was 300 men. But all of the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink the water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver you from the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. And so we see that, that God still, once again, there's too many people with 10,000 soldiers, that, that with the 10,000 soldiers, they still would have taken credit. And I, I think that's kind of crazy that they would have been taking the credit for 10,000 because the odds of, of 10,000 to 120,000 was 12 Midianites to every one Israelite. So that means that every Israelite would have had to defeat 12 Midianites in order to have the victory. That's, that's pretty insane, and yet they still would have taken the credit for that. And it kind of shows just the sin of, of who we are as humans, right? And how, how easy it is for pride to be built up in ourselves and to take credit for what the Lord is doing. And so God needs to split the army one more time. And he tells Gideon to split the army into two different camps. And he doesn't tell Gideon right away who's who, right? He's not saying, this is going to be the camp that you're taking. This is going to be the camp to send away. He just simply says, just split them up. This camp over here and this camp over here. And so I can't, ha I can't help but Gideon just kind of watching this go down where they're all surrounded by the water. All these soldiers are getting down to drink. And he's watching the ones who get on their hands and knees and they go down for water and he's sending them over here. And then he's watching those who just get down on one knee and they're taking their hand like this and they're bringing it up to their mouth and he's setting them like this, right? And he's setting them over here. And by the time they're all divided, he's looking over here and he sees 300 men and then he sees 9,700 men. And I wonder if Gideon was kind of like, okay, God, maybe this is who you want for me, right? The 9,700, these guys all look like they're ready for war and they're capable. There's no way 300, right? Like, like God wouldn't do that to me. 300, there's no way against 120,000. There's no way. And then God says, all right, Gideon, those 300, those are yours for battle, right? I wonder what Gideon was doing at this time. But, but there is a reason for God splitting the army between these two people. And there's actually two different schools of thought. Um, the first school of thought is that maybe these 300 men who got down on one knee and they took their hands and again, they went down to the water and they lapped it like a dog, they brought it up to their mouth, that maybe these were the soldiers that were more alert, right? They were the ones ready for, for war. That when they got down on their hands and knees and they're reaching down for the water, they're looking to their left and to their right and they're watching for the Midianites, right? And they're prepared, they're ready, they might be experienced, knowing to never let their guard down. Where the rest of them, they might not be experienced and they wouldn't have let their guard down. Could be that one. I'm kind of more on the side of the second idea, and that is the ones who went down and put their hand to the water rather than getting down on their hands and their knees were the old fat ones, right? They're the ones that didn't have the capability to get down on their hands and knees. Maybe it was the old guys who kind of had a back problem, and so, be, so they had to kind of go like this and get down on a knee to reach for the water. And the bigger guys that wouldn't be able to have that capability to get down on their hands and knees, right? And so even more so for Gideon to watch the 300 who might have been these old people who weren't ready for war, and then God saying, okay, these are the ones that are ready for war, right? <laughs> and this, this brings us to key number two in our service to the Lord. Key number one was availability, and so key number two in our service to the Lord is our only ability being availability. God did not want to use those who were tough, fit, capable soldiers. Because again, time and time again, as we've seen through this story, the same exact theme, that God wants to use those people, that, that when people look at this victory, they can only say it's through the power of God. That if God was not in it, it could not have happened. And this happened again with Moses when he met with, with God in the burning bush. One of the things that, that Moses said to God, he said, God, who am I? Who am I to deliver the Israelites? But see, that was the whole issue, is that, that Moses was asking, Lord, who am I? But rather than asking, who am I, you should be asking, who is he? John the Baptist would say in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 30, he must increase, but I must first decrease. That doesn't mean, now let me, let me explain that, this doesn't mean that God, that if you're, you're naturally skilled and, and God has given you amazing gifts, that God doesn't want you to use them, right? Or you're not capable to serve the Lord with these amazing gifts. God has given us all very unique, special gifts in our lives, and he wants us to use them 
to bring forth the glory of God, right? Maybe some of you guys are really good with music and you know how to play an instrument. And so God might want to use that talent in your life to be on the worship team. Or maybe you're really good with children, and so he would want you to serve in children's ministry. He's given each of us individually our own specific gifts to use them. But the tendency with these gifts that we need to be careful as as human beings because we like, because pride builds up in our life very easily is to take the credit for ourselves. And so God is making sure 100% that he's going to use these 300 people, the old fat soldiers that have no experience, who, who don't even know how to swing a sword, in order to bring victory to Israel. It says in verse 8, So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and he sent away all of the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. It happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, Go down to the camp with Purah, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterwards your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down to per, with Purah, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites and all of the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. And their camels were without number as the sand of the seashore in, multi, in multitude. And so... God now here is going to give one more confirmation to Gideon and to his soldiers that as they're getting ready to surround this Midianite camp, as it says, it's a giant camp, right? 120,000 people. It's, it's as if it was a bunch of locusts down in this valley. And it says that the camels weren't even being able to be numbered as if it was the sands of the seashore. seashore. And so God wants to give them one more confirmation just to make sure that there's no fear building up inside of them. Because granted, if, if you're standing and you're watching this, this 120,000 soldiers down in this valley, there's probably a little bit of fear that would be building up to you at that point, getting ready to go into war. And so God is saying, Gideon, go down, to, go down to the camp, and I want to confirm to you one more time that I will deliver you from the Midianites. And so it says in verse 13, And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. Really, barley bread of all things to dream about? But it's funny here is that this dream that they had, again, this, this Midianite has this dream of barley bread rolling down this hill and destroying a tent of Midian. And, and you would think, barley bread? Like, that's so random, right? Why, why wouldn't it be like some type of rock, you know? But the reality is, as, as they've kind of interpreted with his friend, is that, that this dream was Gideon, that Gideon was going to come before the Midianites and that he was going to destroy the camp of Midian. And, and his barley bread, does anyone know what barley bread even is? Barley bread is the most nasty bread that anyone could ever eat. Barley bread was something that, that people didn't really eat unless they were like starving to death. It was something that you gave your animals to eat. And so this barley bread is rolling down, and that's the thing that destroyed the camp of Midian, right? And so again, that's just, just kind of funny that, that of all things, Gideon would be likened unto barley bread. But that's exactly who he was. He was just barley bread, and God was going to use him as a rock. But in verse 15, it says, And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. He returned, returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies and put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torture, torches inside of the pitchers. And he said to him, Look at me and do likewise. Watch, and I will come to the edge of camp. You shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also shall blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And so we see as they're getting ready to surround this camp that Gideon splits them up into three different companies. So one company, a hundred over here, maybe a hundred on the other side, and a hundred over here, and, and they're going to do their best to surround the camp of Midian. Now, keep in mind that this is going to be in the middle of the night, 
So they're surrounding the Midianites. Each soldier has one pitcher in one hand and a trumpet in the other hand. And inside of this pitcher was a torch. And so simply the reason for putting it inside of a pitcher, like I said, it's the middle of the night. And so they're trying to be sneaky, make sure that the Midianites do not see them until everyone's in position and ready to roll. And so it says in verse 19, So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had post, posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing, and they cried, The sword of the Lord and Gideon. Now, Try to get a picture here, right? Pretend that you are a Midianite. It's in the middle of the night. It's pitch black outside. You're in your tent and you're fast asleep. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, as you're fast asleep, you hear the sound of 300 trumpets. And, and the, the sound of pitchers breaking probably on the floor. Or maybe they're, they're taking their swords and they're breaking these pitchers. That's a pretty loud noise, right? And so you're waking up in the middle of the night and all of a sudden you have no idea what's going on. You're half awake and you're running out of the camp. And, and around the entire camp, you see all of these torches just completely surrounding the camp with these trumpets going off and 300 people yelling the sword of the Lord and Gideon. Might be pretty scary, right? And that's exactly what the Midianites were. They were afraid. It said in verse 21, And every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran, and everyone cried out and fled. And the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp, and the army fled to Beth Acacia towards Zerura, as far as the border of Abel Meholah. I'm just trying to make up these words, how to pronounce them, I don't really know. By Tabath. <laughs> but anyways, we see here that, that as, again, they're running out, it's in the middle of the night, they're half asleep, they're waking up, they're, they're listening to these trumpets, they're watching all these lights around them, and they're afraid, because though it's only 300 men, as we know, they didn't know how many men they, there was. There could have been 100,000 behind each and every one of those torches. And so they begin to freak out. Some of them begin to retreat, running away. Others begin to just kill each other. They take out their swords, and, and they're confused on what's going on. And so they begin to attack each other. And maybe also we know that it wasn't just Midianites inside of this camp, but there was also um, Amalekites and other, other nations that were making up this camp. And so wonder if some of them thought, well, well, they were confused and felt like maybe they were turning on one another, you know, and so they didn't trust the other nations and they began to kill each other. But either way, the coolest part of this is that the Israelites at this point didn't need to swing a single sword in order for the Lord to work. Their faith in God blo to blow their trumpets and to break their pitchers was enough to allow God to work. And this is where we're going to find our third key in our service to the Lord. So let's look at these trumpets and these pictures, they are representative of something inside of our lives. These trumpets, very simple, as a trumpet was in this war, was declaring who they, who they are and who they were serving, right? So they would blow the trumpet and they would cry out, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And so the same for us in our lives, that as believers, that we would blow our trumpets and letting people know who we serve and who our God is, and that we would be unashamed of the gospel and allow people to know who we serve. Now the torches, on the other hand, Understand, remember that the torches, before they were seen, they were held in pitchers. And these pitchers, they would have been nothing more but some cheap clay pots, right? They would have been completely worthless. They would have had no worth to them at all, right? That's why they broke them, because they didn't have any value. The only thing that they were good for was to hide the light that, that was hiding inside of the torch, right? The torch was inside it to hide that light. But they had no real impact on the Midianite army. The real impact came from the torch. And so this is what this is saying, that you and I, we are called to be just like that clay pitcher, that Jesus would be living inside of us as that light. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, For we do not preach ourselves, but we preach Christ Jesus our Lord and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of power may be of God and not of us. These earthen vessels that Paul talks about in Corinthians, again, simply just means clay. These clay pots, these clay vessels that are of no worth. Yet oftentimes, 
we like to focus more on the, cloth, the pot rather than the treasure inside. We like to think that this vessel is, is so valuable and we like to put the vessel first and we like to think that, that it has some type of worth to it. But the reality is it's completely worthless. The real value is not in the vessel at all. The real value is a treasure inside and that is Jesus or the Holy Spirit that is living inside of our lives. And so here is the key. Listen, not just the torch, but the vessel. The key is this. The vessel must first be broken in order for the light to shine. And so key number one was availability. Key number two, your only ability is availability. And key number three, brokenness equals usefulness. When you finally get yourself out of the way, God will begin to work in your life. And sometimes this process is painful. God will allow times of, of trials and struggles inside of our lives, as we talked about before, to break us down. He allows us to go through that fire to break us down. But the best part is, he doesn't let us stay broken. Once we are broken and we go through the fire, he allows that fire to refine us. Just as Isaiah 48.10 says, Behold, I have refined you, not as silver, but I have tested you and the furnace of afflictions. And we look at afflictions as always as a bad thing inside of our lives. And rightly so, right? No one wants to go through afflictions. If we could, we would like to go through absolutely no difficulties and everything would be great all of the time. But we also need to understand that going through these trials and going through these afflictions inside of our lives is a good thing. That as we go through these afflictions as believers, we can know that there is an end to that affliction. And that God is faithful and that he's going to bring us out on the other side stronger than we were before we went in. And with being stronger, not only that, but it allows us to keep our focus on the clay vessel, not on the clay vessel, I'm sorry, but rather the treasure that is inside. Remember John 3.30, for he must increase, but I must decrease. Worship team, if you guys would like to come up as we, we finish in a song, we'll finish these verses in verse 23. It says, And the men of Israel gathered together from Nephtali, Asher, and all of Manasseh, and pursued the Midianites. Then Gideon sent messengers through all of the mountains of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites, and seize from them the watering places as far as beth and the Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as beth and the Jordan. And they captured two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb on the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb, the heads of Oreb and Zeb, to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. And so we finally see here this this final piece of this chapter that they continue to pursue after the Midianites and they finish the battle and they see this amazing victory. Let's all stand. Church, let me ask you, do you want all that the Lord has for you in your life? I believe that God has a calling on each and every one of us. Every single one of us, God wants to use in a mighty way. But the question is, are you wanting the Lord to do that work inside of your life? Are you willing to be that willing servant, to be available, to not focus on the circumstances around you? to understand it has nothing to do with your own power, with your own might, but that we can be that mighty man of valor through the strength of the Lord. To allow yourself to be available, not to focus on your own abilities, but the Lord's abilities. And as we go through this life, as we go through these afflictions, and, and we deal with struggles inside of our lives, that we can know that we have faith in the Lord and trust in Him that His faithfulness will come through for us time and time again. If you truly want the faithfulness of God, if you truly want his will done inside of your life, you are not going to miss his will. I know a lot of people think that they've missed the will of God, that they, they get to this place inside of their lives where, where they're so afraid of missing out on God. They're saying, well, well, how do I know what God's will is in my life? What if I miss out on the, the will of the Lord? What is going to happen inside of my life? But let me tell you, if you truly with all of your heart are striving after the will of the Lord, you are not going to miss his will. You will not miss it. 
And even if you feel like, like you've made a mistake somewhere inside of your life where, where God had a plan for you, but you already missed out on it and God can't use you. Listen, that is not true. God will continue to use you in your life wherever you're at. No matter what mistake you might have made, no matter where the Lord might have been calling you and, and you might have missed out on, God will still use you mightily. He has begun a good work inside of your lives and will complete it until the day of Christ. And so if you're in here today and you want prayer, if, if you want truly the will of God to be done inside of your hearts, I encourage you to come get prayer. We're going to have leaders up here to pray for you guys. I believe we'll have the back room open for prayer as well. But don't leave here today without getting some prayer. Let's pray as we close. Father, we come before you, God. and Lord, we ask that, that you would have your way inside of our hearts. You would have your way inside of our lives, God. Lord, as it can be hard as we go through this life to focus on you and what you have for us because we're so focused on the circumstances around us and we think we know what's best for ourselves, but the reality is we don't. We don't know what's best for ourselves, but only you do, Father. You see our lives laid out. You see the future. You see what you're going to do in us. I pray, Lord, that we would have that faith and that trust in you to know that you are working and that you are going to complete that work inside of our hearts. I pray if there's anyone in here, Lord, who doesn't know your will, Father, and it's been stressing them out. They've been afraid because they don't know where you're leading them. You, they don't know where you're calling them to go. Lord, I ask that your peace that surpasses all understanding would fill their hearts now to know, God, as long as they're searching after you, as long as they're abiding in you and want what's best and what's wants from you, God, that, that, Lord, they will not miss your will. Lord, I pray for any broken hearts this morning, Lord, any hearts that are hurting, any hearts that are in pain, Father. Lord, that they would look to you and, and not blame you. Lord, not blame your faithfulness failing them in their lives, but they would trust on what the word says, that your faithfulness does not fail. Lord, you will never fail us. And Lord, you will bring us out on the other side of these trials, these pains, stronger than we were before. Lord, that we would be a witness to the lost. Lord, we would have our trumpets in our hand and, and we would be crying out to the rest of this world who we serve, Lord. That the God of all creation, that the King of kings is in control. We ask, Lord, that you would bless today. In Jesus' name, amen. We have one last song, and so please stay uh, before we go. And again, we will have leaders up in the front to pray for you guys. We'll also have the prayer room in the back, conference room open for you guys. And so God bless you guys. Have